because we now seem to be reaching a tipping point um, in further recognition of the colonial and slavery past in the Netherlands uh, and in Amsterdam in particular. Uh, and this month is also Kitty Kati month. Um, by the way, I, the main spoken language is English um, since we have um, international guests and international attendees at the moment. Um, yeah, so this, this month is Kitty Kati month and it's the month leading to, to um, our Emancipation Day on the 1st of July. And the discussion about official apologies for the slavery past is in full swing at the moment. There are recent studies from Amsterdam, Rotterdam and other cities that invest, investigate our colonial, our, his, our own historical role in slavery and colonialism and it also leads to a lot of debates and insights. About two weeks ago, we finally have the first report of the exploration about how we are going to create a national slavery museum. And this is quite an important uh, moment in the process. All the, these developments are the reason for GroenLinks uh, Amsterdam to organize this evening in conversation with you. And um, the program looks as following. During the first half of this webinar, uh, Pepijn Brandon and Francio Guadeloupe will talk about this theme through an academic perspective. And after this, we will have a short break and continue with the second half. During the second half, we will have presentations of uh, Ms. Farida Nabibax and Jean-Francois Manicom, who will both work in the field of art. I, in, as you already noticed, um, our chat is accessible, so I invite everybody to put their comments and questions in the chat. Um, I think it's also possible that if you have a question to digitally raise your hand. Um, and after the, after the first two presentations, we will have room for uh, the questions. I will select a couple, but hopefully we will be able to get all your questions answered. If not, we will make sure to get back to you in regards to this matter. Um, yeah, let's see. I first want to start with um, a film of um, Elderman Rutger Groot Wassink. Arun, can you please start the film? Dear everyone, my name is Rutger Groot Wassink and I'm deputy mayor of Amsterdam. At first, I want to welcome all of you, and especially our distinguished guests. I'm a bit disappointed that I cannot join you today. I have other obligations to meet, but I'm quite sure that it will be a very interesting, respectful and fruitful discussion this evening. This topic is close to my heart. As deputy mayor, I've been very involved in the investigation, the historical investigation that the city of Amsterdam has done to its own slavery past. Um, and I'm quite sure that you will hear about this inquiry later. Who we are as a city defines us. What we share, our past, the beautiful and the terrible stories that are there to tell. That's who we will be as a city. We need to know the facts and not be afraid of the conversation. We need to share stories. We need to share experiences. We need to share the lessons of the past and pass them on to future generations. That's why I'm very happy that three copies of the public version of the book on the Amsterdam slave trade, slave trade is, uh, are, are for free uh, to be picked up at uh, libraries and uh, other institutions in Amsterdam. And last week, there was also another milestone. It was the ending of the phase of exploration for a national museum on transnational slavery. I'm looking forward to all the events of this month. As you know, it's Katie Kotti. And I think, and I'm quite sure that it will be a very special uh, year. And I think that also this seminar, this meeting of tonight, um, will have a, a contribution uh, to, the, to the success of uh, Kitty Kotti this year. I wish you all 
a very interesting, fruitful, respectful meeting and a very nice and respectful Kitty Kotti month. All the best. See you soon. Bye bye. Thank you, Arum, for sharing the video of Elderman Groot Wassink. Um, I would like to give Council Member Simeon Blom uh, the floor for an introduction. Simeon, you are still muted. Yes. Yeah. yes. Thank you so much, Britt. And good evening, everyone. And thank you for being here this evening. Uh, you as our guest in public and of course also our speakers. We have also an international speaker and you will get to know them better this evening. Because we are gonna talk about a very important topic, uh, of course, conversation. And there's a lot I can say why I think it is important to address the recognition of slavery here this evening and also in our politics. There are a lot of reasons. Well, I can give one example that I think uh, will give a good insight in why uh, this is important. A couple of years ago, I had a big, big discussion with a friend. He is well educated and he was very serious and convinced that black people are less intelligent. After all, it is biologically determined, he said, and he has a Caribbean background. We see it in the prejudges and false information people have about Africa, about Africans, and these images in people's head, they are not innocent. They are well spread in our cultures and our structures. We see the importance of it in of the recognition in the fact we have huge inequality between ethnicities and of course in institutional racism in our society. And that marginalizes uh, uh, black people. But giving recognition to it is also about respect, I think, about knowing. It is about learning and it is about educating. I am so thrilled and happy with the way our city government sees the importance of these matters. Our Groen Links, Green Left, Elderman, Rutger Groot Wassing, you have heard him. He's an important ally, as you have heard. And of course, our Elderman, Turia Meliani. They are helping realizing, also with a major uh, Femke, uh, realizing this museum. And they are in a favor of formal apology. Also, my colleague, Eduard Mangal from Denk, who approached me with his wish to ad address this formal apology. But it all started with the grassroots. The activists, the local organizations, who fought decades for recognition, in that we can see the importance of representation in the politics. For me as a black council member, it is my task and obligation in putting forward my political position in helping realizing that what was fought, fought for years by grassroots historians and black Dutch citizens. We are now in a tipping point in history with more and more recognition with the slavery museum and the discussion about formal apology. There is a long road to go and to take. But it is how former President Barack Obama said about the importance of education, about slavery in a penetrating way. A great country does not shy away from the truth. Knowing this different story helps us understanding ourselves and each other better. It binds us together. Through education, we will fight the racism that enslaved people and is still enslaving people today. Through education, we will also promote ethnic harmony and we will teach young people to fight against political hostility, what we see nowadays in Europe and in the Netherlands towards migrants and people of color. We will use education and the formal apology because it concerns our Dutch identity and above all our dignity as a society. Thank you. I want to say, uh, uh, for not having a misunderstanding, when I said they are in favor of apology, I meant Rutger Groot Wassing as an elder man and also Turia Meliani. It is not clear for now what the, uh, the, the, the vision is of the major in making that apology, but the coming days, the coming weeks, we will hear more about that for just uh, the fact. But thank you, and I wish everyone an, an, a good 
an interesting evening. Thank you very much, Simeon, for your inspirational words. Um, I would like to um, continue with our program. We have two um, panelists in the first half. Uh, the first one is Pepijn Brandon. And um, <clears throat> Pepijn Brandon, he is an assistant professor at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam and a senior researcher at the Un International Institute of Social History. He is also a scholar at the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University. And Brandon's work focuses on the history of capitalism, war, and economic development, and of course, slavery. Pepijn is co-author of the book, The Slavery in East and West, the Amsterdam Study. And Pepijn is, is going to present findings of his research on the role of Amsterdam in the slavery past. Um, Pepijn, the, the floor is yours if you're ready. Thank you, uh, Brit Marie. And uh, I, I first want to say uh, that when uh, Simeon approached me to speak on this uh, panel, I had not a second doubt uh, because uh, I think Simeon has been so central in actually galvanizing this political process in, um, in Amsterdam. Of course, not alone, of course, not without the grassroots movements that, that supported uh, this process for a very long time, uh, not without others like, uh, like Eduard uh, Mankal and uh, uh, Silvana Simon, uh, Simons, but, but, uh, but I, I do think that Simeon played a, a crucial role. So, uh, so I was very enthusiastic to say, uh, to say yes when, uh, when, uh, when I was approached. Um, what I'll do is I'll talk a bit about the uh, Amsterdam report. So I'll share my screen for a very limited PowerPoint. There we go. Uh, many of you will, of course, have seen the book that uh, resulted from this collective res uh, uh, research that we um, executed over 2019, 2020. Um, it was a book uh, edited, let's see whether this goes full screen, okay, a, a book edited uh, by a team that, uh, apart from me, consisted of Gunnar Jones, Nancy Yao, and Matthias van Rossum, but over 40 scholars participated, uh, uh, elucidating um, uh, various aspects of slavery in Amsterdam. Uh, and the conclusion that we drew from that uh, was that the involvement of the Amsterdam city government in slavery and the slave trade was large scale, and I, well, you'll see a number of terms listed. I'll, I'll, I'll explain them one by one, large scale. Uh, so large scale means that um, among other things, that in the uh, 17th and 18th century, uh, at least 135,000 enslaved Africans traversed the Atlantic on Amsterdam ships. Tens of thousands of enslaved people were moved across the Indian Ocean uh, uh, because of the actions of Amsterdam officials of the Dutch East India Company and Amsterdam private, uh, uh, private merchants. The involvement was global. It reached from New Netherlands uh, in North America to Brazil, to South Africa, to large parts of Southeast Asia. It was direct, and this is an important thing to stress because for many in the past, slavery has been something that belonged to a number of commercial companies, the Dutch West India Company, maybe the Dutch East India Company, if people knew something about the history of slavery in Asia, um, but not of city governments. But the Amsterdam city government was involved very centrally in organizing and facilitating uh, uh, slavery. Slavery was a topic on many meetings of the Amsterdam city government. The relationship uh, of the city government of Amsterdam to slavery was multifaceted. Far too much in the past, the attention to this topic has been about economics only. Did slavery make rich people in the Netherlands money? And of course it did, <laughs> but that is not the end of the involvement in slavery. 
the involvement in slavery encapsulated the creations of laws to facilitate the creation of slave societies and the repression that came with it. It was a mental involvement. It created, uh, it involved the creation of stereotypes uh, uh, about uh, 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 black people and people of color that persisted long after, uh, uh, after slavery. It was military, it was political. And this uh, involvement was long lasting. We have to remember that uh, the Netherlands was one of the last uh, Western European countries to abolish slavery, only in the second half of the 19th century. And with that long lasting legacy, a uh, uh, long lasting involvement in slavery, we shouldn't be surprised that it left an enormous legacy and the effects of that uh, remain continue to be felt today. So I want to make that sort of broad statement a bit more tangible by talking about one specific mayor of Amsterdam, Nicolaas Witsen, at the end of the 17th century, here portrayed in 1688 in a lush Asian uh, dress, a, a Japanese uh, a gown, um, uh, reflecting his deep involvement in the Dutch colonial empire uh, uh, globally. Witsen hailed from a long line of uh, members of Amsterdam city government. Um, his father uh, was a mayor as well, like he himself. Um, his father also was one of the directors of the West India Company. Actually, a fortress along the West African coast was named after his uh, father, Fortress Witsen. Um, uh, he, um, and he was one of the richest uh, people in Amsterdam of his age. I believe he was 16th on, on, the, on the list that was compiled of the 250 most, uh, 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 250 richest people in the Netherlands at that, uh, at that time. Um, Witze, um, as far as I know, did not invest economically in slavery a lot personally, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't involved. Actually, he was centrally involved. Witze was a member of the committee uh, that was formed in 1682, the committee of, uh, of uh, Amsterdam magistrates who discussed the future of the colony of Suriname and came up with the idea of creating a body to control the col colony of Suriname that was one third part uh, owned by the WIC, by the West India Company, one third by a prominent Zeeland family and one third owned by the city itself. He was one of the people responsible for this takeover where the city bought its share in the colony of Suriname and therewith the right of the mayors to appoint the directors of the uh, society of Suriname and to have a direct say in how this most important slave colony of the Dutch in the Atlantic world was to be governed. He was mayor in the year that the society of Suriname was established. And as I said, his involvement didn't end with the Atlantic. He was also a director of the Dutch East India Company at a crucial period of expansion of slavery in the Dutch East India, uh, uh, um, in the Indian Ocean uh, world under the VOC. The reason why I chose Witsen, because there's many mayors of Amsterdam for whom the same story applies. The reason why I chose Witsen is that there is such a, um, a clear, he's such a clear illustration that for the people at the top of Amsterdam politics, there was no clear separation between politics on the one side and business uh, and family business on the, uh, on the other. Throughout his reign as mayor of Amsterdam, uh, Witsen closely corresponded, uh, uh, with his, corresponded with his friend, the then governor of Suriname, uh, Johan van Scharphuizen. Through this connection, he arranged the marriage of his nephew, uh, nephew uh, jo Jonas Witze, uh, who was actually the secretary of the city of Amsterdam, to the daughter of a rich planter and a minister of the Suriname Reformed Church. The marriage was strategic. It brought economic gain to the family because it brought into possession three large Surinamese uh, sugar and coffee plantations, Waterland, Surimombo, and Palmeniribo. Palmeniribo, of course, for those of you who visit 
visited already the Rijksmuseum exhibition, was the site of a revolt in 1707 that was repressed uh, brutally. This is sort of, if you've seen the museum exhibition, which I can recommend to you strongly, uh, because I think it's, it's, uh, it's beautifully done. Uh, the, the exhibition revolves around the stories of individuals, and it very skillfully tells the story of one of the leaders of the revolt on the Wit Witsen uh, 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 plantation, uh, uh, Valley, the, an, an enslaved African. Um, so here we see this direct connection between politics, between uh, 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 economics, and the lives of the enslaved, including the resistance of the enslaved and their uh, and its repression. <clears throat> now I was asked to uh, speak very briefly, so I'll just leave it at this illustration. But I want to say something <coughs> about what's ahead of us. And of course, we're all eagerly uh, waiting for this decision of the mayor of Amsterdam to whether uh, uh, she will endorse the apologies for slavery. But it's also clear that apologies are not enough if they're just a symbolic moment. If it's not, if they do not express the intention to deepen our understanding, to deepen our connection to this uh, to this uh, to this past and to con continue this um, uh, this this program of learning and research that has been going on uh, now over the past couple of years. <coughs> so I want to stress one thing. I think the Amsterdam report was a great start, but we intended it as a start, and it remains a start. We asked forty-one scholars, "What do we know already about slavery in Amsterdam?" And slavery and Amsterdam's connections to slavery were so extensive that the answer, answer was quite a lot. But that, that has to be, um, there has to be a, a sort of, that is conditional. Um, because quite a lot meant that we know that a lot of the connections ran through Amsterdam. And no, none of our authors had a problem coming up with examples of people in Amsterdam who were somehow involved in slavery. But why Amsterdam was so central? how it fought for its centrality, how it kept its centrality. All of that is much more of a puzzle. And we know some of these things, but we uh, don't know the half of it. It's also a very positive example of uh, pos uh, a positive um, uh, development, of course, that now um, uh, almost every city of Amsterdam wants to know about its, uh, of the Netherlands wants to know about its slavery past. And actually Rotterdam, I have to say, was earlier than Amsterdam in commissioning its, uh, its, its, uh, its research. So Amsterdam in many ways followed Rotterdam. So that's a great, uh, uh, a great development. And it's very important that we realize that slavery was not an Amsterdam story. That was the story of the whole of the Netherlands. But this shouldn't make the Amsterdam city governor sort of rest easily. Because having said that, it's clear that Amsterdam always was and remained the center of the slave of the Dutch, uh, uh, the Dutch slave-based economy. So we have to know what was the influence of Amsterdam on national and international politics on slavery. What were the how were the relationships between Amsterdam elites and those of other cities in the Netherlands in slaveholding constructed? What did this actually mean for the lives, the struggles, and the cultures of the enslaved beyond a, a number of limited examples that we already uh, uh, already uh, uh, know of, because that part of the story for a long time was ignored by sort of historians in the Netherlands. What does it mean for the legacies <coughs> of slavery in financial, systemic, cultural, and mental uh, terms? And especially, how were these legacies transferred? It's one thing to say racism today is a legacy of slavery. I completely agree. How was racism kept alive and how did it evolve out of this sort of poisonous legacy that slavery, that slavery produced? All of those are large questions and it means that we haven't begun, I think, to answer those. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're only at the, at the very beginning. I'll, uh, and I want to leave it at that. Thank you, Pepijn Brandon. 
um, I see some questions in the chat. Um, I would like to invite everybody to uh, put their comments and questions in the chat. We will discuss your questions and there's more room for um, the answering the questions after the second presentation. Um, and the second presentation is done by Francio Guadeloupe. And uh, Dr. Francio Guadeloupe is a social and cultural anthropologist. He has worked at all major universities in the Netherlands. Um, his principal areas of research have been on the manner in which popular in which popular understandings of national belonging, cultural diversity, religious identity, and mass media constructions of truth continue to be impacted by colonial racism and global capital. He has pursued these interests in his research and publications on social processes on the island of St. Martin, uh, Curaçao, Aruba, Saba, Sinterstaches, Brazil, and the Netherlands. Um, furthermore, he is the author of the monograph Chanting Down the New Jerusalem, Calypso, Christianity and Capitalism in the Caribbean. Uh, Francio, the floor uh, is yours. You're still muted. <laughs> there we go. Good evening, everyone. Let me just share my screen uh, quickly. I had a PowerPoint. Share, there we go. So let me begin. Um, you will have noticed that the event tonight is actually in a question. How do we need to deal with the colonial and slavery past in Amsterdam? And I'm going to offer a redescription of that because that's the kind of anthropology I do. What you need to recognize is the moment you ask such a question, you get two sets of images. Images of what used to be called the East Indies and images of what used to be called the Dutch West Indies. But you need to note that there are two questions here and actually six. Six simply means that there are more questions than only the two questions involved. There are questions like, what about the Dutch involvement uh, with slavery in Suriname? What about the Dutch involvement of slavery on the Dutch Caribbean islands? And there you have six different answers. What about the Dutch involvement with slavery? And then you have to include Indonesia as part of the making of the uh, world system that we live in. And that means also the Netherlands in relation to other um, uh, works of slavery, the encomienda system and so forth. Um, and of course, when you go to colonialism, Dutch involvement, with colonialism in Suriname, et cetera, et cetera. So we're talking about a whole set of questions. Now I can't do justice to all the questions, so I'm going to focus on a set of them. And this is my focus. I'm gonna focus on a cluster of questions which have to do with the question of slavery. And through that, I'm going to rethink the afterlife of coloniality. And the afterlife of coloniality means particular habits of coloniality in our thinking, also academic thinking, activist, intellectual thinking, and in the arts and in politics, the way we think about the, the situation. So the cluster necessarily invites us to recognize that when we think about the question in relation to Amsterdam, as Papan just said, it's a translocal because you also have to take Rotterdam, The Hague, Zeeland into account, uh, Liverpool and so forth. It's a question of a national question. It's also a transnational question. And it's an outer national question. Outer national because multinationals were not, their, gam, their ambit of operations was broader than the question of nation states. So all of these you have to take into account when you're trying to answer this. Now, in beginning, and I'm going to be using Caribbean thinkers, I start with Sylvia Winter, Caribbean thinkers that are not necessarily historians. Sylvia Winter, when asked about the question of the afterlife of slavery and coloniality, she said, let us not mistake the map for the territory. The map is a particular discipline that tells us this is what happened. 
but she's saying the territory of what happened and its afterlife is always much broader than whichever uh, um, academic dis discipline we use to start to make sense of it. So two things. One is we need to recognize that history is not the past. History is a map, a particular operation on the past. You can also use theology. You can use anthropology. You can use arts. History is not the past again. History is one particular operation on the past. If you treat it as the past, whichever archives you use, if you use oral next to the archival, the written, etc., that's still not the totality of the past. Secondly, when you uncover the logic, the structural logics of transatlantic slavery, you cannot confuse that with the totality, which is non-reducible because it was persons with their singular experiences and sometimes their collective experiences in groups that were experiencing the question of slavery and coloniality. Therefore, whatever um, um, historical uh, narrative you present, it isn't the past. It's an operation on the past. And I think we need to keep that clear. And that's something that uh, the Jamaican philosopher Sylvia Winter tried to make clear when this discussion was taking place in the Caribbean and the US. Secondly, when we look at the logic, and that's important because history matters. When we look at the logic, we see that it's a question of natal alienation, which means that people were taken from one place, brought to the other place, and much of their cultural um, uh, traditions and ideas, there was an operation to try to undo that. You need to remember that, that when we look at the logic, it was inherited. If your mother experienced it, her offspring might also experience it. But it was gendered because it also depended on who was the father. It was general dis dishonor for the people who were treated this way. There was violence, and not only symbolic violence, very real violence. And the man, and the man simply means a particular conception of the human, which was a Eurocentric conception of the human, looked at people who look like me and people who look like that person in the um, painting and called them slaves, called them objects. What that means is that it said, just like I have animals that I am domesticating, I'm going to call these human chattel. It was about treating them as commodities, so tingification, as it's called uh, amongst Caribbean thinkers. And it was not only uh, an economic operation, but it was also oftentimes theology first, Christianity um, legitimating it, sometimes contesting it, but also legitimating it. And there was science, which later on became racial science, as Papan is talking about. But those that were treated as though they were slaves responded. And we have to look at the various responses. So they responded sometimes fleeing and creating maroon communities in which they fought. And there was what is called petit maronage, the little things that they did to disrupt it, sometimes um, poisoning the food, but also sometimes burning the plantation. All of this was happening, which means these people never accepted to be treated as though they were slaves. Thus, what happens, and this is happening in the Netherlands too, we get a new category entering, the category of the enslaved, as it's called. And we see in the, in the, um, the realm of the arts, intellectual work, also academic work, that that is becoming the new uh, category or concept to call the people who experienced transatlantic slavery. Here's a question. So you have the slave or the enslaved. And there's a whole discussion about that. Here's a question. When you look at it imagery, you see that these are the only, these are the dominant ways in which we think about that past and think about its afterlife. It's either people who were victims or people who fought back and sometimes both. They were victims and they fought back. But we can't think about people who look like me 
in the dominant narrative outside of these choices. Here comes my anthropological thing. Is this not a very historically focused discussion? Is history not becoming metaphysics and actually then obfuscating other ways of understanding the past? And you need to remember that history is not the past. History is an operation on the past. You can look at the past or operate on the past through different disciplines or through the arts and so forth. So what I'm gonna offer and I'm coming to the end is another perspective. Thinkers who I work with, um, who work on the Dutch Caribbean or thinkers of the Dutch Caribbean, a set of them, one of them is probably here, Charissa Granger, uh, Nikki Mulder, Jordi Hoffman, Nicole Sanchez and so forth. We're working with a concept that is called trans-Caribbean thought. We're saying we're not talking about decoloniality. We're not talking about post-colonialism. We're talking about trans-Caribbean thought. We're recognizing that when we have to think as people who study with people of the Dutch Caribbean or people who have a Dutch Caribbean background, we need to recognize that we speak many languages. Each language is a way of understanding the world. We are mixing those languages. We're recognizing that we need to blur the distinction between art and science and blur the distinction between spirituality and science. Those were inheritances, uh, Eurocentric inheritances that we have to rethink. So Trans-Caribbean Thought, and there's a book coming out next year, April, which will introduce Trans-Caribbean Thought. It's coming out with Rutgers University Press. It's called Equiliberty in the Caribbean, and therefore all these thinkers will then present much of their work. If you look at it from the perspective of Trans-Caribbean Thought, then you recognize that it's being informed by Caribbean thinkers, thinkers like Lissant or, or Kamal Broadbeck or uh, Derek Walcott, but it's, tra it's multilingual, translingual, so it's also Benitez Rojo, all these thinkers. And once we take that, then it says, who are we talking about? These people who experience transatlantic slavery. And it recognizes that in the Caribbean, so the premise is, with these thinkers that were not only historians, they were historians and poets, historians and theater makers and so forth. They say, no, we start with the recognition that there were people taken. Some arrived and others did not arrive. Those that arrived, we will not call them slave or enslaved. We will call them the arrivants, those that arrived and do not equate them with the concepts of slave or enslaved. These were people that were busy actually in their moments of freedom trying to human different. That's a concept of trans-Caribbean thought. It's not become human, it's humaning different because these people recognize that if you treat me as human chattel, my emancipation must also be the emancipation of other forms of chattel. One of the thinkers that you can read about is a book that I teach at the University of Amsterdam of Patrick Chamois. So he's talking about the relationship between dogs and other animals and people who were taken from Africa and how the emancipation of one must be the emancipation of how we treat other animal life. So it's about humaning different. What does that mean? I'm coming to the end. You see the picture of Malcolm X. It means recognizing that there was a genesis of dislocation. Thus, the arrivance is a double refusal. It's a refusal to be uh, co-opted by the concept of slave, and it's a refusal to be co-opted by the concept of enslaved. It says the totality of the lives that people lived in the Caribbean or the Americas, those who arrived, you have to do the work to recognize their lives and what they did was not only react, there was also creative processes. And those creative processes cannot be uh, subsumed under the category of how they revolted. They were living lives. They were finding ways to create new things. Much of the culture that we talk about, the Black Atlantic culture, is part of creativity. And it can't be reduced to those two concepts. There's a recognition that all myths of Genesis are myths of relation. The peoples in the Caribbean said we are related to the people in Africa. We're related to the people in Asia, but we are none of those. We are creating ourselves. 
and hence the ex of Malcolm X, remember his mother was from Grenada, the ex is embraced as an unworking of gender, sexual forms of oppression that we know re exist, racial fraternalism and essence talk. But the X is never going to be removed as the idea of the nation of Islam. It is more the Kamal Brathwaite's X in his poem, X Self, in which he says, the X of Caribbean people is that we can't be reduced to any kind of continental thinking. That's our X. Therefore, it's a double refusal of any kind of historical operation, even in its positive significations. Almost there, people. What does this mean for dealing with slavery's or the colonialism's past? Going back to the question. It means, and it's important, that you have monuments and there's going to come a, um, a uh, museum. It means that Everything you do must permanently acknowledge the double refusal of the arrivants. Otherwise, you remain in Eurocentric discourse. So you can have a museum, but in that museum, you have to acknowledge that these people who experienced transatlantic slavery were enacting a double refusal. They were creative. They were not only reacting. Yes, they were reacting, but it was more than that, which means all acts of reparations are also acts of undoing the fixities. Because the moment you accept that you are the category of slave or enslaved, you accept the category of a particular kind of hierarchical relation. You can't get out of it. So when one says, no, I belong to the Arivans, or Bob Marley said, we're the Black survivors, that means we don't have that relation. And if I refuse that relation, it means you have to do work on yourself, who presupposes that historical or that hierarchical relation. And it also reparations. So it's not against reparations. You have to repair the thing. But in repairing the thing, you have to unwork those categories because we don't have that relation with one another. So in trans-Caribbean thought, we recognize the importance of the operation on the past of conventional historians and also what poets, artists, and others are doing for instance, in, in the Candomblé and Umbanda and so forth, Santeria and so forth. And lastly, people who were treated as commodities, therein there has to be a critique, not only of making people commodities, but also a critique of all forms of, of property. Culture is not property. Land cannot be property. So a radical critique of that property thinking that you nowadays see. Now, if you're interested in that, in Rotterdam, one of the books that came out was a book that said, we are not going to reduce it to history. We're going to take different disciplines, activists, uh, anthropologists, musicologists, uh, people who actually create food, and we're going to work photographers, and we're going to put it together to recognize that nothing captures the X self as Kamal brought it, we had called it. Nothing captures the Arivans. The Arivans are making themselves and they're not in a relation as you would like to have it, even though you're trying to positively place it. Thank you. I hope I was not too long. Thank you very much, Francio. It was a really interesting and I I myself, I heard some new things. Um, I was wondering, I'm going to check out the chat if anyone has some questions. I do have, yeah, I see that someone asks, thanks or says, thanks for this very, in, thanks, this is very interesting. What's the name of the book that you mentioned, which speaks of emancipating multi-species? The book will be called Equiliberty. And there's a set of um, writings. One of the persons is there, Sharissa Granger, who is working it out musically and thinking about, for instance, the chapi, the hole that was used to, to work the land was also an instrument used in music. So work, labor was connected to work, a work of art, and troubling these distinctions with the spirits that also came from Africa and Asia. Thanks, and I have, I have another question, uh, Francio. 
can you perhaps maybe put some other names of Caribbean thinkers uh, which you find inspirational in the chat if people want to have more information in regards to the subject? Um, let's see, people, um, audience, if you have any more questions, please put them in the chat. I did see a while ago a question to Pepijn, um, but I think you've answered it already, Pepijn. Yeah, it that was um, uh, a very justified question. Uh, someone asked um, uh, whether I meant that we are already beyond apologies and that was certainly my point and uh, not my point my point was that we need apologies but we need more than that right so uh, so that was a, a very necessary uh, clarification because um uh, well we haven't seen the apologies yet right that's that's to start with hopefully we'll see it soon oh you can yeah of course you can also raise your hands um if you want to ask the question in person um panelists do you have um maybe questions for um francio or pepijn if there's someone raising uh, their hand so i will uh, let them talk elon you are still muted Yeah, Ivan, you're you're still muted. Uh, maybe you can unmute. It's an, on the bottom uh, left bottom of your screen. If it's not possible, you can still write your question in the chat, and we'll get back to you. Um, I see another question coming up in the meantime. It's a question for Francio. Um, it says, "What about the?" maternal consequences using Arifant, what does that mean for the reality um, we still live in? For example, how people are still treated in the light of this history. Okay, I was, that's a good question. Uh, as I said, uh, or as, as was written in the PowerPoint, it means that there's an also to reparations. You have to repair the damage done in the past, the material repair of the damage done in the past. But in doing that, you need to think, unthink that relation. And that means you need to recognize that these people live the lives. You have to name them. You have to do that work to recognize what kind of lives they live. What did they produce? Because there can be no globalization. There can be no global cultural industry without the work of the Black Atlantic, and that was the work of these peoples. So yes, they experienced victimization, but they were not victims. They experienced victimization. And they reacted to that, but they were also creating other things. Let me stop there. Thank you, Francio. Um, Elon has typed this question into the chat. He says, I am white and I was wondering what resources you would all recommend when it comes to reading material or video material. I do not have a microphone, so I'm always muted. I couldn't type when you tried to unmute me, so that's why it took a little bit longer to write. Um, yeah. Oh, my bad pronouns are she okay yeah so do we have any suggestions for um elon or maybe we can write some down in the chat um maybe that would be an option in regards to um lit literature or um yeah videos in the meantime i also have a question uh, i see a question in the chat for um yeah it was a question for the pain uh, you had your PowerPoint slides, I think it's the last one, uh, where it states much work remains to be done. And someone asks, what about the descendants? Yes, yeah, so I, I was asked to, uh, to speak specifically about the research part. So I focused very much on sort of the question of research and what research remains to be done. But of course, it would be 
preposterous to say that the main thing that has to be done um, after sort of slavery is uh, is more research and more knowledge production in academia. I mean that is that is absolutely not the the, the point. So partly it's about education throughout society, right? And the sort of a conversation throughout society. But I do think that that sort of the real work that has to be done is much more fundamental. And I think Francio and I actually are, are very much on the same uh, page uh, uh, in this uh, in this uh, in this matter. That if slavery is at the root of a series of um, colossal um, historic injustices, that uh, this is not undone until those injustices are resolved, right, are overcome. Um, as long as the injustice is there, that is sort of that is the legacy of slavery, then uh, the work is not uh, is not finished. And this is, I think, in every aspect of life, it's about inequalities. It's about uh, it's about racism. Uh, it's, it's about sort of the the the, the deeper mental legacies, the, the very potential of thinking about people in terms of uh, in terms of commodities. But uh, but uh, and that is again, I think, very close to what Francio is is uh, is uh, is suggesting that it doesn't end with a number of specific injustices. Of course, I'm very much of the school of uh, Eric Williams and C.L.R. James and people like that who, who who said sort of the legacy of slavery partly is is capitalism. It's it's the kind of modernity that we in, inhabit. Um, it's uh, it's the fact that everything in life can be commodified from nature to uh, uh, to the things that we consume to sort of to to human beings uh, itself. So of course that leaves us with a very extensive and ambitious program if it comes to um, to uh, to what reparations could uh, could mean. And there's always the danger that uh, a program then becomes so extensive that the powers that be can hide behind it and can say, well, if we can never repair this, then we don't have to do anything. So, so in the meantime, I would say there's a lot of sort of concrete and material things that you can push for. And one of that is sort of is knowledge, research, education, uh, um, uh, but, uh, but others are about sort of the inequalities that exist in housing and in, uh, in, uh, in labor markets and in general, in the way that sort of people are treated in this society. Thank you, Popraim. Um, so this is the end for the first part of, um, of this webinar. Uh, we're going to take a short break so everybody can grab a drink or coffee and then we'll we will return at eight. So that's in five minutes. Um, so see you in a bit.
Welcome back, everybody. It was a short break, um, but hopefully everybody's hydrated at the moment so we can have the second part of this webinar. I see in the meantime, we have more attendees. Now we have 32 participants. Um, and the second part is more or less the same format as the first part. We will have two panelists who will give us a presentation. And afterwards, we have room for discussion or questions. Um, the first panelist who is going to give us a presentation is uh, Mevrouw, is Miss Farida Nabibox. Um, she is a theater maker, performer, visual artist, and philosopher in her work. Uh, she is concerned with raising awareness on, on the unconscious traces of the colonial past in contemporary society. She's also the founder and artistic director of Reframing Her Story Art Foundation, which focuses on raising awareness and education about the colonial and slavery past of the Netherlands. She is momentarily also researching how dance can function as an effective me methodology to make emotions surrounding the slavery past tangible and open for discussion. Um, Ms. Farida Navibax is going to present uh, presents us through using personal elements, how dance and performance can make emotions of the past tangible. And she will elaborate on how necessary this process is. Uh, Ms. Navibax, the floor is yours. Thank you, Britt Marie. Um, I have to, uh, to do a small correction. I'm not leading the, the um, the research I'm participating in, so, but I'll come to, come to that later. Um, so I will have a personal approach um, about the impact of uh, um, the past, the role of art and especially dance, but I have a PowerPoint ready. Let's see if I can do this myself. And then Ooh, how is this going to work? Okay, what happened? <laughs> okay. Okay, I don't seem to get to to uh, present a few. Maybe if you click on from current slide. Oh yeah, okay. If my computer um, wants to work with me. So you can already see the, the title. Um, this is our production, Schitterende Schaduw, Radiant Shadow, um, which is about um, the, 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 the history and the slavery background of 17th, 18th century uh, Gelderland. And um, it's actually based on facts. So uh, the PowerPoint is not working right now. So I have to go by um, Okay. And um, what I wanted to do first is to um, to, to go through my personal story. So I was born in Suriname, which was a colony of the Netherlands. Um, and my father was from Indian uh, Surinamese descent. So his, that means that his families um, were, Indian people were brought to Suriname from 1873 on, because that was uh, 10 years after the Kitty Koti Day, Day of Emancipation, uh, July 1st, 1863. So um, uh, the people, the, the, the enslaved people had to work for 10 years longer on the plantations. So after that period of time, Indian people were uh, brought from India to Suriname. So my father is a descendant of one of them. And my mother is, um, um, my mother is from, African Surinamese descent. So that means that her family members um, were enslaved people who um, had their day of emancipation on July 1st and then had to work 10 years longer on, that, on those plantations. 
I must say that my PowerPoint doesn't want to work. It's still doing not what I want. Uh, Arun, could you, could you help me with that? Can I stop yes. share screen? I saw in the chat, uh, Farida, um, press F5, that might work. No, no, it was uh, it was not responding. My my computer is not okay. responding at whatever I do. So I, I will uh, can... share your presentation. Yes, but then we are now um, at the point that um, the third slide. Could you please show the third slide? Because uh, when I came to the Netherlands in the eighties, I um, um, had lots of people asking me, oh, are you from Sri Lanka or Pakistan or uh, perhaps Egypt and all kinds of, yeah, for me, exotic uh, countries coming from Suriname. And I never owned up to my heritage that I am from um, Suriname in, at that time. And I guess why now looking back, why I didn't do that is because I then would have had to own up to this slavery and indentured labor background. And it is something that I couldn't face then yet. So um, in my forties, things changed. And um, I, I felt at some point a wound inside of me. Could we go to slide two, please? And, um, and I knew that the, this wound would, it did have to do something about the slavery past, but I didn't know, I thought the word slavery, I'm not a slave, what does it mean? It, it doesn't feel, what, what is it that I feel? So when I went into that, I found, found out that what it says was that I am, I had a real deep feeling of being inferior. So a re, real inferiority, feeling of inferiority and feeling as if my, my dark skin was, I was ashamed of that. And as if everyone could see that I have this background and I cannot hide it. It's there for everyone always to see. But then there's this thing that when I would, at one point when I could talk about it, um, people would ask, really? You think that you feel something that goes back, what, five generations? And I would, I wouldn't know what to say, but then um, I had a present from my family, from my daughters and my husband, and it, uh, it was a DNA test. And if we could go now to slide number four, Arlen. So this is uh, the, the, the N5, please. So that's where I um, can take you through the, the DNA test that of course I knew from my father's lineage that 50%, um, so Northern and Southern of India, that that would be my DNA. But then what was so shocking to, to, to see is that, that the whole West Coast of Africa, um, as if people were torn from one and the other side and thrown in a boat and then brought to the Caribbean, which is, is of course exactly what happened. And there it is in my DNA that is so scattered and so from all over the coast of the West Coast of Africa. And um, also that there is a, a European part of me, but then of course you can never know, but I find it difficult to, to, un, to, to try to understand if that would have been a loving relationship Probably not, but that's also very difficult to realize that all these things that drive, would drive you apart, that that's all inside of me. So it's really something to get by. But what is also there, it's proof for what I already feel. And I can say that the feeling was first. It's not that when I saw the DNA test that I thought, oh my God, what is this? the feeling and everything that I explored inside of me was first. So um, if we can go to the next slide, Arun. As a performer, I thought um, I want to, to share this with my audience. I want to take the stage and, and connect with people in front of me and share the feelings that are inside me. 
but then it was eight, almost eight to 10 years ago, it wasn't the right time. We were not ready for that. So it didn't happen. But now, um, two years ago, uh, we started here in Gelderland with uh, uh, research on the traces of the colonial and slavery past. And um, I joined in because I thought this is right. This connection of uh, the fact that the, the research delivers and what I have to, to share, the emotions that I have to share, that makes a good connection. And it's exactly what I would want to um, um, make my work, work about. So that is what I'm doing now. But um, you might ask, why dance? Because what is dance? Isn't it something of uh, passing time? Or um, what is it? Or, or what does it do? Well, I, I think, I believe that it is an experience. When dancing, your whole body is engaged. Your whole, um, the, the essence of you is also engaged in, in the movement. You can be moved, literally, but you can also be moved. You can move others figuratively. And um, there's also space, always space involved in, in dancing. You cannot dance. Um, on a screen with a screen, you, you, you need the space around you. And um, there's also always a relationship between you and the space and you and the other people that are there. So I think that there is some deep connection when dancing that we can uh, exchange feelings for which you might not even know you have them or you might not even know how to voice them. So in dance, it becomes clear and you can connect and um, actually raise awareness there in um, whenever the audience is, is sitting there and they see and experience what is going on in front of them, something of that, of that touches them, but then it can open up and they can uh, have revelations and, and be, um, um, yeah, uh, altered, they can be altered by seeing dance that is profound. And then there's also something else that is really important for me in doing this. First, I didn't know it because you, I'm, I'm so into the body and performing. And at one point I thought when reflecting, this is also important to give space to the ancestors because they were not seen, they were unseen, they were um, they, they, they were not recognized and um, something has to be done here to let everyone see that these people, as was said before, have been here, have been in these spaces. So also in the Netherlands, people have been here and they worked and they went into some an an anonymity. But I am here as a descendant of these, one of these two and many more of these people. So it is as if I have the task to give the ancestors their space so they can be here in the Netherlands with other people, with those who are seen already. And um, I think this is something that we can heal from. So give space with some kind of ritual and um, connect with each other and dance together and later reflect. I think that is in this, there is uh, immense healing power. So if you would want to uh, search for the, um, the traces of the slavery past of Gelderland, the Erfgoed Gelderland, this is the link. So um, you, you can find that, you can also, you can find that a lot of um, information there. And if we go to the next slide, Adam. Yeah, um, this was talked about uh, uh, earlier in your presentation uh, of me, Brit Marie. Uh, the Radboud University is doing research uh, and it's called uh, Feeling the Traces of the Colonial Past. And it's how dance as an effective methodology can make the past palpable, tangible and negotiable. Um, and it's, it's being led by Professor uh, Liedeke Plate and Vicky Fischer is uh, also working on it and I'm involved too. And um, it is about 
um, what I, so we, the, the research will, will be about what we are presenting, the reaction of the public, and we, well, we still have to find out what it will be um, in detail, but something about what happens there, that we are on stage, we are doing the work, the ritual, using the space and being present, and what, um, what triggers the audience, what touches them, and what happens with them. And afterwards, uh, there will be dialogue. And we also have the chance to do workshops on um, um, body work and, and dance afterwards. So um, this is what I do. And it, we, we just started, but I could feel how powerful this is. So that's what I wanted to share with you. I think we still have one slide. Yeah, this is a still from uh, my solo performance, and this is called Traces of Time. And um, I did this, I made, I created this performance after I went for the first time in more than 26, perhaps 27 years to Surinam. And um, well, of course, that was a roller coaster. But when I got back, um, this is what came out of me. And when I, uh, now, when I see it, I can see that I do a lot of ritual there. But when I was creating it, I was actually thinking quite technically. So I would stand here and I would go up to there, go down there. And so something happens when working so intuitively that you connect. And of course, I know a, a lot already. Of course, I did my research. And so I have knowledge. But then connecting with your intuitive knowledge, something somewhere you know something. And this seems quite fake, but I hope you understand because I know what the essence is. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a performance about colonial and slavery past. And when, I, when the music is there and I'm in place, something happens and um, I think that is the, the that is what art and what dance can do. You can transcend, transform, touch, um, reach out, connect with people, with the audience, because everyone, um, we are all bodies that are moving. So we recognize that, and all our uh, whatever our past is, as as an audience member, uh, you can be triggered at a lot of things that happen in front of you. And it doesn't have to be something that I deliberately put in my uh, performance. So it's for everyone who is present, it does something. So um, yeah, I think um, this is it. <laughs> and we still have one slide, I think. Yes, the last one. So uh, I can say that Schitterende uh, Schaduw, Radiant Shadow, will be seen for the first time in a long time, of course, at, uh, in, in Arnhem at the Sonsbeek exhibition as, uh, uh, part of, as, as part of that, so July 4th. And we will announce next week, um, so everyone can look on our website from next week on where precisely and what time. And um, so the information about that will uh, be on our website and the website of Sonsbeek exhibition in Arnhem. Thank you. Thank you, um, Farida. I see that we got a question in the Q&A. Um, I would like to invite everybody again to type in their questions or raise their hands, uh, but we have room to um, for questions and discussions after our last presentation. And our last presentation um, will be the presentation of Jean-Francois Manicom. And he is the lead cur curator of the Trent Atlantic Slavery and Legacies at the Liverpool Slavery Museum. I think it's an international slavery museum, right? Um, yeah, before coming to Liverpool, Jean-Francois worked as a curator of the Memorial Act. It's in Guadeloupe. Uh, it's an island of the French West Indies. And it's the first memorial site dedicated to the history of slavery. 
and made way to contemporary Caribbean art in the Caribbean region. Uh, Mr. Manicom helped build this museum from scratch. And in 2015, he directed and curated the first international festival of Caribbean visual arts, where 41 contemporary artists from the Caribbean had their works displayed. He is also an internationally prized photographer and film director. Mr. Monikom is going to um, will present how the specificity and the history of the International Slavery Museum. Um, we'll talk about it as an activist museum. Besides, um, he will he will elaborate more about the function of contemporary arts. Mr. Manikon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Brick Mari. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today. And uh, thank you, Farida, your presentation was brilliant. Um, in terms of uh, uh, personal background, I come from Guadeloupe and I have uh, the same type of uh, story from yours, Farida. Uh, I have three parts, three big parts in, of blood, in my blood. One coming from India, uh, as, as you, uh, for uh, free workers coming after the period of slavery. The other part is coming from uh, enslaved people from uh, West Africa. And the third part of my blood coming from enslaved owners uh, coming from Ireland. So, um, I share with you a, a, a kind of a secret of family, family secret and family shame. But the shame for, in my case, coming from my white blood. So, uh, for example, I pretend myself that I was blacker than I am for years and years. And I really, I white, how white I was, I was a teenager. So, um, so the, the big issue with us, in my family was accept the blood coming from the enslaved owners. It was a, we, all my family pretend that we are coming from Indian and black enslaved and that it's, and it was, I had to recognize at some point, and we made the, the, the DNA test in order to prove everybody that we have, yes, we have a big, big part of white blood. So yeah, this is my journey. So let me, um, I will try to share with you my screen. Up, up, up. Can you see it? Yeah, okay, so more than a formal presentation, please take this moment like a discussion in discussion between us and uh, a way for me to share uh, to share my my conviction. Uh, the International Slavery Museum, I will say ISM to make it shorter. It's an activist museum. It's important because it's in our DNA. But let me, I, I will give you some, uh, a little bit more of context. So ISM is a big building in red bricks. We are talking about the city of Liverpool, which is the European earth of the transatlantic trading system. The epicenter of where the more boat lived for the African coast. Just to give you an idea, uh, Liverpool alone has sent more boats than the port of Nantes, Bordeaux, and La Rochelle in France altogether. So it's a massive issue for, for Liverpool. It is roughly, roughly, roughly 5,000 departure for a total estimated of 1,500,000 people deported from Africa to the Caribbean and the Americas on the boats 
coming from Liverpool. And it is with this story and I've been enriched colossally thanks to this past that the city had decided to forget it during decades. It was not until uh, 1980 and the opening of the Merseyside Maritime Museum, which starting to speak about the maritime, maritime history of Liverpool and evoke just a little bit the slavery trade. But in 1981, for several days, the Liverpool 8 riot, we call it uh, Liverpool 8 because uh, Liverpool 8, L8 is a postal code of Toxte where the black community lives. So the, the Liverpool 8 riot broke out because of unemployment, police harassment, and structural racism. Dur during this riot, more than 1,000 people were injured. 500 were arrested, 80 buildings were damaged and destroyed, and 100, ca 100 cars were damaged and destroyed. Just to give you a, a, a little bit uh, the scale, the scale of, the, of this riot. After the riots, in order to understand what happened, and why the government, uh, uh, what happened and why, the government appoint a commission. The commission of inquiry named the Scarman, Scar, Scarman Reports, it's the name of the guy, the Scarman Reports, point out the discrimination, injustice, and social disparity suffered by the population of Liverpool 8 and make recommendations, notably cultural, and concerning the, and concerning the under-representation of black culture in the public space. With the massive effort of militant associations who fight and militate and pushed in 1994, the Transatlantic Slavery Gallery was created in the basement of the Maritime Museum, which spoke exclusively about the subject and which was a kind of dedicated exhibition. But it is in 2007, on the occasion of the bicentenary of the English abolition, and also under the pressure of activists and communities, that we took the opportunity to create ISM an independent national museum, which actually is the only one in England and the only national museum in all Europe dedicated entirely to the question of slavery. And I mean the transatlantic slavery, but also the contemporary form of slavery. So that's happened in 2007 because the, the power of the activist but also before of the volunteer of the, 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 the actual, the, the director of, of this time, the director of National Museum of this time, whose name was David Fleming, Dr. David Fleming, who decided to create this type of museum. So it's a conjunction of, it's a momentum. It's always a momentum. And I will take the, the, the example of, Memorial Act that we totally uh, drilled from nothing. It was a, a polit good political agenda, good power of, uh, of uh, fighters and activism. And sometimes there is a kind of, honestly, honestly, uh, magical things that things happen now because it's a, it's a, it's a perfect momentum and it's like dance parida it's it's when it's the moment it's the moment but you can push for years and years it fits it's in if it's not in the agenda of a political or a volunteer of a mayor of 
it, it will not happen. So there is this type of magical moment when things can happen. And uh, I, I see that, I saw that really in Memorial Act. And sometimes you have to push uh, it in, in ways that you cannot imagine. And sometimes you have to make things like uh, a little bit, honestly, uh, pirate way, pirate way. way. I, I mean, uh, pretend that you're going to do something and make something else and make it really, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's very difficult because it's not, okay, let's do that. It's, it's kind of permanent negotiation, permanent, permanent fight. So ISM now is a free entrance museum with uh, out of out of the pandemic time uh, 1000 people a day with a total since opening of more than 4 million of visitors in 14 years so a very successful uh, museum with also a very very high traffic on our website so works in in ISM is above all the acceptance of being more than a museum. We must not hide our face. More than in any field of monstration, the very particular and painful subject on which we work means that we cannot claim any kind of neutrality and consider us as a neutral space. A museum is anything but not a, a neutral space. And for me, to believe in this neutral position is at best to show great naivety and at worst to play the game that the scientific or political authorities at the level of local, municipal or national ask you to play. At ISM, we have been forced to accept that our visitor consider us as a hybrid space. Not because we, we wanted it or conceived it like this, but because hybrid is, and complex is their own feeling when visiting us. Maybe it's the absence of a place of recollection, the absence of grave, graves to honor the ancestor in the public in the public space. Maybe it's a great national, European, and international silence that have surrounded this story, but we become more than we had intended to be. I can uh, honestly consider us to be in the middle of a crossroad. The museum of tomorrow, the coming museum, and I'm talking mainly about museum that talk about traumatic or difficult stories, must be placed between the traditional notion of museum and an active contemporary art and experimental centers. We must build, manage, and preserve an heritage collection, but we must also rely on contemporary art and artists. By buying works and commission them, but also create the condition for their creation through artist residences, for example. Knowledge, knowledge, fact, historic, and scientific approach are not enough. And I was happy to, to, to hear Mr. Guadeloupe, Professor Guadeloupe say the same thing. Uh, we are talking about traumatic stories that have affected millions of people and the legacies of which are always open scares and injuries. We need inter interdisciplinary. There is a limit where only sensitivity can make us feel. Only poets, dancers, performers, visual and sound artists, videographer, photographer, 
can open doors for us. So let me give you a few examples. Who else can talk about feeling guilty about being a victim? Who else can speak about self-denigration? About the colonial gaze on yourself? Who can speak about family, family silence? and about family secrets that often surround the origin. What about the strange relationship between Caribbean people and the danger of the cursed sea, the danger coming from the sea? Who can speak about the strange and ambiguous bond of love and repulsion between a country and its colonies? What does it mean to feel like a foreigner in the so-called motherland? Who can evoke the gaze that has been worn for centuries on the black body? Where is the limit between exotism and racism? If I accept the European point of view and vision, may I have an exotic gaze on my own body? Who will create a new imaginary, an Afrofuturist poetry that runs behind its own past? Who will mix together the worst of the past with the better of the future in order to build a little way for today? Who will break the conventional codes of representation and will create a new myth? Who will try to escape the kind of aquarium of his own certitude and stereotype? What is the way to go out of our own bubble? Who's going to talk about the double punishment of being a woman's body in the middle of an ultra violent society where the body became a commodity. We will talk, talk about the female trauma that will certainly be transmitted in an visible, invisible, and unconscious way from mother to daughter. They are the ones we'll be looking for. There are artists from all over the world. Whether they speak your language or not, their message does not need translation. As a curator, we have an obligation to manage our collection. But as a curator, in difficult issues, our obligation goes beyond that. We have a moral obligation to create the condition of an emerging sensitivity. Thank you very much. So I make it short in order to keep a little time for uh, question and, uh, and debate. So this is a credit of the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Francois, for your powerful presentation. It was really, truly inspiring. Um, if there are any questions, if people have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat. Um, I did see that we had a question. Um, oh, I, I think... Uh, Ms. Navibox already answered the question. Uh, there was a question in regards to her slides of, with the DNA. Um, someone asked, do you think that we are our DNA? And um, yeah, Ms. Navibox, maybe you want to elaborate or can I just um, read out your answer? 
Yeah, Ms. Labibak said, um, it is said that this is what we are. And what I said was that my DNA test backed up my story as if I'm more allowed to feel what I feel. Thank you. Um, are there, if there are any questions, please put them in the chat. I do have a question um, for um, Jean-Francois. Um, does the ISM, um, because it's an international museum, uh, does, is there more focus on, for instance, the British slavery past or the slave trade, or is it like the uh, focus, does the focus, uh, is there a focus on like the whole international um, slavery past in general? Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, we are international, so we try to speak a little bit of the story, the interna international story of of uh, of the slavery. So we try to speak to have an international perspective, but at the same time, this story is so big, and the implication of Liverpool is so deep that we are uh, a little bit. I have to recognize that we are a little bit focused on the British uh, part of slavery. At the same time, um, we have this type of obligation because we are very, very, very alone. So because we are so alone in, on, in this country, we have this type of obligation to, to speak about everything. So <laughs> we created a, a plenty of frustration. We know that we have we are created frustration from the audience also. But uh, it's because I think that it's one of the reasons it's because of the unique uh, unique situation of ISM. And I will be happy, I will be very happy to share with another museum and to say, okay, I'm going to focus on that. Please, can you focus on that? But I have no choice. We, are, we have to do everything. So that the museums are more complementary to yeah. one another. Yeah. And yeah, like my, my following question is indeed like it's it's quite a big story. Um that the whole slavery past, and even if you focus on the British slavery past, um, as a curator, how do you select the stories that you want to tell in the museum? Uh, I will say that. Uh... The, the pot of money is a, it's a good uh, type of selection. We do what we can. So we do with the budget that we have. So in terms of practical, we have to, I have to recognize that um, um, money, it's a, it's a big issue. It's something that we have to learn to how to, 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 to work. And the good thing is that uh, because we have made the constat that we cannot handle enough and the problematic is very intense. So we, we are trying now, we are in the middle of, of, of a river actually, because we are going to change totally ISM. We are, we are fighting for a, a big amount. It's uh, several million of, uh, of pounds. It's really a, a big amount of money in order to, totally rebuild the collection and rebuild the museum. So hopefully if we're successful, we are going to close in probably one or two years in order to build another museum. So on a personal aspect, it will be very, very interesting for me because it will give me the opportunity to build a second. So it will be the second, the second time that I'm building from um, a, a slavery museum. And will there be a certain subject that you want to focus on more? Uh, I think that uh, we're going to, to rebuild the way that we're speaking with our audience. And I think that we will focus a little bit more on the, contempor the contemporary form of slavery. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions or maybe the other panelists want to uh, react? Simeon. Uh, I have one question. Um, thank you, uh, Francois. Um, Liverpool also uh, gave uh, apologies 
I've also visited your uh, museum, um, and indeed, it, uh, I, I was really uh, emotional when I visited your museum. You even uh, give attention to uh, the Dutch uh, slavery in even Suriname and even uh, Dutch Caribbean. So in that sense, it is really international. Um, and you start also with the, with uh, West Africa before the Europeans came to West Africa, and that inspires me uh, also uh, in my in my uh, uh, vision uh, that we also should do something like that because our history did not begin with uh, slavery, um, but Liverpool and also uh, London um, ten years ago or longer ago also uh, uh, did apologies. Uh, were you also part of those processes? And is there something you can share with us about how that went and what impact it had? Um, I'm not a specialist of the history of Liverpool, to be honest. Uh, I arrived in Liverpool in 2000. When I finished with Memorial Act in Guadeloupe, I arrived in 2016. So the process was, was on. And ISM had uh, at least 10 years old. So I, I'm not a specialist of how arriving the, the process, how the political process arrived. Uh, what I can say is that mm, it's like, a, how can I say that? It's like putting, putting water in a mill. More you're putting water in the mill and more the mill can turn like that. So, uh, to, to, to be honest, uh, it was very difficult for, for Liverpool to, to recognize his position in, in terms of slavery. It was difficult for the politician. It was difficult for the white community of Liverpool. It was difficult for everybody. But, and we, I, I, I have the same example in Memorial Act, but difficult, okay, it's difficult, it's painful, it's, uh, but when ISM starting to grow, when the reputation of ISM starting to grow, when people was traveling from everywhere to visit ISM, when uh, ISM starting to have a big reputation, international reputation, little by little, little by little, everybody finally was happy with that. And it's ISM made the job to make people happy with that. So people who was really against ISM or against the fact that speaking about them and say, oh, it's an old, old story. Why are you going to be in this old story? It's finished, go on, uh, uh, think about uh, future. So people in this type of mood are happy now with and starting to be, to be and, and for, for now it's one of the attraction of the city of Liverpool. So Liverpool now, it's not only football, it's not only Beatles, it's also uh, capital of, of the slavery trade. And uh, so what, what I can, uh, I don't want to be wrong and tell you things that you're not sure about the process to arrive to the, to the apologize. But what I, for my understanding, apologize um, as, as um, People, uh, it, it's not necessary to see that as a danger. I see the, the more conservative part of the society sees that as a danger, but it is not. It's yeah. not, there is no danger. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think I recognize that when I visited the museum, I think more than half of the people who visited the, the people I saw were uh, white people. So young children with schools visiting, you know, and that is the direction we need to go. Uh, and I think it shows the reason why it is important to have such a uh, museum because it has an effect. Uh, 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 like the, the example you give for, about a water mill. Uh, when I look at uh, England and the discussion, of course, England, the, the United Kingdom and England has, has its issues. But uh, I think it's really inspiring to see that even institutions like universities and, and banks are uh, studying their role in history and uh, uh, organizing funds, uh, funds 
for investing in the West Indian University, for example, or other types of funds. And uh, I hope we in the Netherlands uh, can have such a wind uh, water mill effect, water bed, uh, uh, water uh, mill, water mill effect uh, in the future. Uh, so we just started. Honestly, and, uh, honestly, I think so. One one of the big uh, there is plenty danger uh, in in in. Uh, opening and walking on a museum uh, about slavery, plenty of traps and and difficult issue to 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 deal with. But one of them, it's making a ethnical museum or a community museum or a racial museum or a museum for black community. So it's 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 for my understanding, it's really a big danger to make a, a, a communitarist museum. And because why is that a danger, why? Uh, I think it's a danger because it uh, it will it will uh, avoid um, a big part of the story. Uh, story of slavery is not the story of black people. It's not. It is in a in a sense, but it's also uh, the story of capitalism, the story of extractivism, and th this story of capitalism. It's, it's the story of change. everybody. It's even it's, climate uh, change. Even yeah. climate change. So it's it's a story of absolutely everybody on this planet is impacted by the by the slavery trade. The slavery trade was the the the, the we, we all know that it was the 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 the, the draft of. Of capitalism, it's 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 became uh, capitalism and colonialism. It's a uh, version two. It's a version two. It's a 2.0 version of of slavery. So so definitely, if you're making something very communitarist, you 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 cutting this part. It's 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 a story of of the humanity, and for the case of 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 uh, England. Of UK or United Kingdom, it's very remarkable because uh, the the people who was who have the capital, the money, who own the plantation in Caribbean in my country was the same who had the mills in Manchester. So they was oppressing at the same time my ancestor and the ancestor of my neighborhood with with a white worker coming from. Uh, uh, so it's a commune story. But I, I don't want trusted the 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 time with Marie. You. Well, it's okay. Thank you for uh, elaborating, Jean Francois. Um, are there any final questions or final remarks? Um, things people want to say before we're um, finishing up this seminar or I would this want webinar. To say something. Brit Marie, can I yeah, say sure, something? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I uh, in 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 my work in the the new work Radiant Shadow. I think what we do is bring uh, the past together. So it's not a, a piece about black people, nor about white people, but it's like a small community. But um, you see the past as you haven't seen it before, and it. I think that is it affects everyone who's in the audience on and on their own level i don't know how to say this i hope you understand um because everyone recognizes something whether um you're from um, um whether you're white or black or in between or whatever so um what i, I understand what you say uh jean francois because um it affects it's about the past is is about us all not not only black people yeah that's what I wanted to elaborate. And at the same time, you have to deal, sorry, Brit Marie, but at the same time, you have to deal with the frustration of, of members of the community that won't make it a black story because there is a, a, a lack of recognition. And uh, the lack of recognition is so big that it's right that we need, as, as a black community or, or descendant of enslaved we need somewhere we need something we need a place 
it's our place, it's our venue. So it's, it's normal when I say we have to, to share the story with everybody and with some, some people can be, um, um, uh, can be angry with that. Can be, I, I, and sometimes I have to deal with the frustration of activists that say, no, it's not, uh, uh, it's not a human adventure, it's a black adventure. So, so it's, I think that when you're working on the field of curating or creating a museum in the field of slavery, you have to be ready to deal with the frustration. You cannot make the ideal venue where everybody will be happy. You will have a, an amount of frustration with, but you have to, to, to deal with that. And you have to, to, if you want to do it, you have to, 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 to have the shoulder to handle this type of problematic. Yes. Thank you, um, Sean Francois. I think we are almost, um, yeah, it's almost nine o'clock. So we should um, round up this webinar. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to thank you, Simeon, for organizing um, this great initiative. Um, and I enjoyed being the host for tonight. Um, and it was an honor to be the host of all the panelists as well. And hopefully we'll have a follow-up um, as this is an important subject, which deserves more attention. I think everybody would agree. Um, but I would like to invite Simeon to, uh, for some final words for this evening. Yes, thank you, Britt, very, very short. Uh, I want to thank you and all the guests, guest speakers, the people in the public, and also uh, uh, GroenLinks, the people who work for GroenLinks in making this evening possible, and also in making this uh, subject, this, this matter, uh, possible in using our position as a political party. Um, when I hear the questions and the, the discussion and the presentations, which are uh, really refined, and high quality. I hope you all will play a role in this further discussion in the society and maybe in the museum, but that's up to you, uh, up to your entrepreneurship, but it will be good, I think. Um, but this is precis precisely the reason why uh, I am determined also with other people um, in remembering uh, this, this story and the strength and the courage of uh, my ancestors. And so we all can remember, we all can learn and respect. It is a story of the Netherlands, of Dutch people, of black people. It is both, it, uh, it, it's, it is both. Um, so we can respect. And, um, and I think, uh, as I hope that this museum will contribute to a more proud and uh, mature uh, society, uh, a self-conscious uh, society, uh, which a society that is emancipated uh, because we have a long way to go. Um, yeah, there's not much more I want to say. I want to thank you again for, for this evening um, and uh, until the next time. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks to the panelists, the audience, Simeon. <laughs>